All right, who's ready to learn about Drop Wizard? Woo! Yes! Who here has used Drop Wizard before? Even better. <laughs> I could make all of this up, but I won't, but I won't. Okay, um, let me close these slides and we'll get this show rolling. Okay, my name is Michael Kolakowski and I have been a developer in the Omaha area, or I should say in and out of the Omaha area for oh, about the past eight years or so. Um, I say in and out instead of off and on because uh, last year, actually, yeah, last year we moved back to Omaha from Massachusetts. So um, we'd been here previously, we'd moved away and then we moved back. So it's been some interesting journeys. Uh, I currently am with McCallion Associates at Northrop Grumman, doing cool stuff for them. We like to do good things, and you can find me most places on the internet uh, at mcolacow, mcolacow, at whatever. I even still have a Hotmail account somewhere that hasn't been checked in years. Okay, so I'm excited to tell you guys about Drop Wizard. Uh, the reason being is it's something that we started using at work. And then I saw, if you notice the potential topics on the previous slides, I said Drop Wizard. I'm like, cool, I can talk about something. And I'm doubly excited because, uh, like I had said, it actually about a year ago that picture was taken. And if you look in the way back there, you can see uh, this is like our mailbox. And so the snow's just about going over it. And that's about halfway through the blizzard conditions that happened in Massachusetts. So, oh my goodness, we had, uh, what was it, 110 inches of snow, and dealing with that, dealing with nine feet of snow on your house, on your roof. And then the next thing was, I've also spent the past oh, year and a half futzing around with Oracle and um, what was that? That was EBS out there and a whole bunch of other fun Oracle products. So I've been super excited to actually get back into the Java world and come to OJUG and, and start learning some new things. So got this opportunity to use Drop Wizard for a project and now I get to share some things with you. So that's why I'm excited about Drop Wizard and excited to tell you all about it. So now that I'm back, Arrow keys don't work for this for some reason. Okay, so what is Drop Wizard? Oh, hang on. Okay. Drop Wizard is kind of like a library slash framework that helps you develop RESTful web services and then so much more. So in a nutshell, um, the idea is to quickly be able to stand up uh, different types of web services and their goal was to bundle a bunch of other libraries together so you don't have to worry about that stuff. So let's talk about a few of those. Okay, there's like three major ones that come with Drop Wizard and then a whole bunch of other ones. So the first of those being Jetty. I mean, you pretty much need to have HTTP for a web app, right? And Jetty's kind of the de facto standard. It's well known, it runs well. Drop, whistle, Drop Wizard bundles it in for you so you don't have to worry about things like dealing with memory and deployment issues and class loaders and all that other stuff. So we've got Jetty. Uh, then next up, uh, Jersey, which as uh, most of you I'm sure know is the JAX RS reference implementation. So Jersey is your RESTful services framework. Uh, the Jersey goal is to not just be uh, a reference to the API, but to stay up to date, to build a developer community uh, around it and you know, get people um, involved with that as well as being able to make it extensible. So they have APIs for extension for Jersey. That's a really small logo in the corner. Okay, and then uh, finally we've got Jackson, um, which yeah, 
I don't think there's a Jackson logo. That made me kind of sad, but Jackson for JSON. Uh, not a whole lot to um, develop on there. I think the last release for Jackson was like in 2013. But if you've done any web development, you've probably heard of those. You've got the Jetty, Jersey, and Jackson. So the three J's, right? And then a whole ton more. Um, Guava, which I know will excite Juan, uh, comes with the uh, Hibernate Validator, Metrics. You got your SLF for J included in there. Uh, you got templating thingies like Free Marker and Mustache, and probably a couple other things as well. So, all sorts of stuff with uh, comes with Drop Wizard, and we're going to put it all together here in a little bit. So, what I'd like to do is walk through a sample Drop Wizard application, show you how it works, and show you how all those different pieces get tied in together. They have a recommended uh, structure to their application. So if you go through their tutorial, they talk about having uh, configuration and application, um, a representation and a resource. So uh, that's sort of the basics of a Drop Wizard app, how you can get it set up and stood up really quickly. So. Without further ado, oh, nope, wrong one. OK. So right, we've got Jetty, Jersey, Jackson, and then configuration, application, resource, and representation. So let's take a look at what that, what that looks like. Oh, this will be interesting. Hold on. Okay. Let's see if this works. As in, it's definitely going to work. I gotta unmirror or mirror my display, but we'll see if it works to undo that for us. Okay. Because I'm not gonna be able to. Uh, go through uh, the project and like keep looking at the projector. Okay, so um, let's start. How do you start using Drop Wizard? Super easy. You just include it in your palm. So here's what the palm looks like. We need to make this a little bit bigger. Is there, there's, yeah, there we go. Holy moly. Okay, can you all see that? Good enough. OK. So simply just include it as a dependency in your POM file. And that's about it. There's a little bit more. So they recommend doing the fat jar thing. And you'll get to see that in action at the end of this. So to do the fat jar thing, that's just the Maven Shade plugin. So include that as uh, one of your plugins and set up the right goals. Throw in your main class, and you're done. So that's step one to using Drop Wizard. Okay. Next up, we talked about uh, the configuration. So let's take a look at that guy. OK. The configuration class is basically a map between a YAML file that you use and your Drop Wizard application. <clears throat> so we can take a look here, and we can see that presenter mode doesn't do the hover over, does it? That's actually smart of them. OK. 
So, but we can see that we're including IO drop wizard configuration. Um, in doing that, we have a couple things like uh, allowing us to um, set up a bunch of properties in this class. So I want to show you that uh, we have a template here and a default name here. So we'll just have it called OJUG and then standard getters and setters because we're using Java. And we have uh, JSON properties and um, here's the Hibernate validator stuff saying that, hey, we want these to not be empty when our app runs. Okay. So that's the configuration class. OK. The next thing we need to take a look at is the uh, YAML file, actually. So we'll go over that real quickly. OK. Um, how to get out of presentation mode? Anyone? It's not working. <clears throat> and I know why it's not working. Probably because I have the uh, Vim extension on IntelliJ. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. I'm sure there is. OK, let's take a look at the YAML file that we got for this guy. I apologize for the clicking around. There it is. Cool. OK, that's all that's in it. Remember the template and the default name? So we can set it to world. <coughs> and in this case, our template is just like string.format. Hang on just a moment. OK. So there's our YAML file. We've got our configuration class. <clears throat> the next thing would be a resource. So the resource class here um, doesn't actually extend any other like drop wizard classes. Okay. But this is how we set up <coughs> excuse me, all of our uh, endpoints for our app. So let's pull this up a little bit bigger so we can see it. So here's where you get to see all the um, some of the RESTful web service stuff. So you use the app path annotation to say, this is where I want it hanging off of my uh, Jetty web app. And then in this case, we're going to just use the app produces annotation to say, hey, we want this to spit us back some JSON. Here's our template and our default name again. And to make it interesting, we have uh, an atomic long counter. Um, so that way we can have something that you know, actually increments behind the scenes. Here's our at get annotation to say, hey, this method is a get. You can use post. We actually use that at ours. And then uh, use the at query param uh, to say optional query parameters. And here's the little bit of guava in action with the optional. And so that's saying, hey, we don't have to give it a name, but we can if we want. So the query param is what reads the, um, your parameter off the end of your query, just like when you're doing regular uh, rest get queries. OK, so nothing super complicated there. So let's go to what they call the representation. And that would be this guy. So we needed something here to be able to instantiate and say, hey, this is what we want our string to look like, so to speak. 
So this guy has just the ID and a content in it. Um, and it's a, basically a simple POJO. That's all there is to that. Nothing terribly complicated here. And then the other fun part gets to be in the application. So let's go there. That's not what I wanted. Okay, so the application class extends uh, drop wizard application class, and then we template it on our configuration that we created before. Remember, the configuration is the mapping between the YAML file and this application here. And so when you extend application, you have a few things that we need to override. So we have a, a get name method. You can put whatever you want in there. We have an initialize method and a run method. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. Um, of course, we've got the main, and in main we just call run. And then initialize, we don't really have to do anything there for a very simple app. In the run method, all you have to do is instantiate your resource. So create that resource that we had before. And you'll see that when we instantiate the resource, that's where our template, which was the string from the YAML file, gets injected. And the default value, or default name, gets passed in as a parameter there. Okay, and then to run this, you simply use uh, environment.jersey. So that hangs off the drop wizard class as well by uh, extending that application class, gives us access to that. And you say register resource, and that's it. Okay, so you might be asking, what's this health check here? That's another feature that Drop Wizard includes. They have this concept called health checks, and they're a way to allow you to um, kind of inspect that your app should be doing what it's supposed to be doing or has the right resources, for instance, when it starts up. So they highly recommend having health checks. And so we have a, a sample health check here. So we can go to that class. Okay. And all this health check has is a template. And then we're going to uh, basically uh, make sure that our, this is kind of a stupid health check, but there's not much we can do with our Hello World app. But basically, we, we want to do some sort of assertion in our health check and then return like a result unhealthy and say, hey, um, you've done something wrong or return result.healthy. This is useful because when you start up your app, you, the health checks will fail or not fail quickly. And so give you an indication if things are set up properly. Like you might use a health check to make sure your database connection is up, for instance. Okay. Um, Let's see what we got here. We've got the configuration, application, the resource, the representation, and the YAML file. Tie all those together, and you've got a very basic drop wizard app. So let's see this guy in action now. make this so you guys can actually see it. There we 
we go. Okay. Okay. Got our palm file there. So all we have to do is build this. And you might have seen that Maven said, hey, you're doing the shaded jar bit. So if we take a look at our target directory, let me see if I can make this readable. See if that'll fit. Okay, so there's our large jar. It's not that big, it's 14 megs in size. I guess it depends on how you look at it. And so to make use of this drop wizard app, all we have to do is say java-jar, specify the jar file, you use the server command and then specify your YAML file. And you can see we've got our Jetty server running. Tells us that we've got our um, get endpoint with a hello world hanging off the end there, registered. And let's take a look at that. I'll just use this Firefox here. So if we go to localhost colon 8080 slash hello world, that ought to work. All right, well, let me try something else. Did it? Finally. Okay, that's crazy. Why does it take that long to um, go to localhost? Goodness. Uh, so in here, you also can see um, your requests in a log. So it's kind of handy. And see your responses as well on your terminal. So you can, have, you can set up logging through Drop Wizard. We had that. Um, I'll tell you, actually, all about how we're using it once we're done here. Okay, remember the at query param with the optional? So we can do something like name equals ojug. And there we go, we've got hello ojug. Okay, that's really small. Okay, so it's not entirely, this is not like the world's awesomest example, but it gives you a really quick intro to it, and you can see how simple also it is to set that up. I mean, it's a few files and um, an entry in a POM file. So I like that because I don't have to think about getting all the other stuff set up to try and, um, you know, when all I care about is creating some sort of endpoint. Okay, uh, oh, one more thing. Um, let's see, I think it's 8081 slash metrics. Cool, okay, so we've got, uh, metrics, which are returned to us in a nice, uh, you know, parsable format here. Uh, so remember the, uh, I think it's Apache metrics library that's included. So you can get metrics on your app and, and requests. Um, and there might be, uh, we might be able to do health checks, I think. Nope. So we can get, um, the metrics thing is useful to see, you know, maybe how long things are taking, for instance. Okay. That's our app. That's all there is to it. 
Um, what else is next? Okay, so let's make this a little more interesting. Let me pull up this guy here. Okay, so as I stated, I work for Northrop Grumman. And as it goes with government contracts, they get to have all sorts of interesting things. And so in our particular case, uh, our application calls out to an external web service. However, that web service is only available on base. So I'm at the Northrop Grumman building off of 370, not on base. I have no access to that. Well, that service decided that they were going to go through an upgrade to a new version with a bunch of changes. And uh, we needed to uh, upgrade our side of the app so we could make the proper calls to that web service. Well, how do you do that when you can't test against it? It kind of sucks, to be honest, right? It's, it's like the worst thing as a developer. You're basically developing in the dark. Well, they hand you a guide. This is what the government contracts do. And they say, here's your guide. Um, go ahead and write something off of this. I was fortunate enough to get some WSDL files, but they were kind of out of date. So, all right. What we did, though, was we were using Drop Wizard to uh, stand up what looks like an external web service, so then we can have our app hit against it. So we had, just like you saw there with the Hello World app, we have our Drop Wizard app running on a CentOS VM so that code from our various baselines can go hit it and we can say, hey, are we making the right requests and getting the right responses? And we're actually using it for SOAP requests and responses. That's something you can do. So that's where the WSDL file comes into play. Um, we tried using, um, if you've heard of WS import, I think I have a little slide on that. So WS import will take your WSDL file and schema and it generates a whole ton of useless code. Uh, but seriously, it <laughs> well, it was a new thing for me. You run the WS, the, the WS import goal in Maven, and suddenly you have like 500 classes sitting around. The idea is it's supposed to generate everything from your WSDL and schema that would allow you to make your requests. So we used that. We also just used it for the straight rest calls for the SOAP calls. Uh, so we have code from our various baselines that calls out to this. It looks like the new service. So then we can write tests. We can do unit tests. We can actually stand up our app, have it call this service, and get a response back, and then parse that response. So it's been incredibly useful for us. We were able to. Um, make all the changes necessary to go to the next version of that external web service. And then it was actually deployed out on base officially like a week ago. It's funny because now that I'm talking about this, it makes me realize that we did the whole thing, deployed it out on base without ever actually hitting the web service. So that's kind of a weird thing to think. And um, as far as I know, our side is working uh, as it's supposed to. <laughs> yeah. So they have all these interesting requirements like uh, two-way SSL, which we uh, did with Drop Wizard, and digital signatures, which we did as well. Uh, so you can configure Drop Wizard to need client authentication. That all goes in the YAML file. You can configure it to, like I said, log. So we're able to send our requests and see that they're coming in the right way. Um, that was another useful thing for us. So that's kind of it in a nutshell for how we made use of Drop Wizard. It was sort of a thing where they said, hey, you, um, this web service is upgrading, so go use Drop Wizard and, and stand this up and then upgrade our portion for the web service. 
All right, so what else can you do with Drop Wizard? I mentioned that you can uh, do stuff with databases. Uh, they have some like Scala plugins, and there's a whole host of other different things. So what we've talked about tonight only just barely scratches the surface. Uh, there seem to be a lot of capabilities, and you know we're not using it for like a production app. I suppose that you could. Um, like I said, we're just using it for the testing side of things, and it works perfect for that. Start it up and let it run. Like I said, ours is on a CentOS box, so we threw a script in Etsy init.d and have it run as a service, and you're good to go. And that's really all I got for Drop Wizard. So, questions? So, talk a little more about the soap stuff, please. Sure. So, you just had the WSDL, you didn't have any data, and you took the WSDL and stood up a soap service that looked just like the real thing? Yeah. I mean, that's what a WSDL is supposed to do for you, right? And then I you think. you use, like, Faker to make the data, or you just have the same thing come out every time? Or? So, okay. Um, the WSDL, using WS import, you get all these classes that are generated, right? And then one of those classes, you can look in the WSDL and you can see the, the bindings to, uh, between the WSDL file and, and what the service is expecting. So then you can say, okay, create this class, populate it with some data. And because we were already supporting this external service just on a previous version, like version three, and now we're going to version four, I have a general idea of what things need to look like. But even better than that, <laughs> I called the folks on base and I said, hey, can you just send me an actual response? <laughs> an unclassified one, right? But I was able to get an actual response uh, from them and then use that to say, okay, this is what the data looks like. So it's been a really interesting journey, like I said, of kind of developing in a box without any access to the rest of the world. I, I don't recommend it, but if you have to do it, then this works. Does that answer your soap yeah, kind of questions? Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that still have soap in their world. Yeah, it has its place. So yeah, again with Drop Wizard, Drop Wizard supports authentication, and in this case that was really critical. Um, that was one of the key upgrades to the service. They went from uh, one-way SSL to two-way SSL. Is uh, has everyone heard of that? Does everyone know how that works? So who hasn't heard of two-way SSL? Okay, cool. All right, so. Uh, let's try and explain that briefly, because that's useful to know. So, uh, one-way SSL is uh, kind of like what you see up there, right? HTTPS. So, you are requesting a certificate. You're the client, and you're requesting a certificate from someone like Google or the bank. And you want to say, hey, I need to figure out that you are who you say you are. So the certificate has all the key information in it, and your browser should have a list of trusted authorities, and you have this concept of a trust chain. So you look at who signed the certificate and who signed that one and so forth till you get to a root certificate authority like VeriSign or I think Thwart or whatever. So that's one way SSL, okay? Makes sense? Hey, I got to get a certificate from them. You use this every time you log into your bank. Two-way SSL is the server asks for a certificate from the client. So they want to make sure you are who you say you are. So it's like going to your bank and saying, hey, I want to make sure that you're Metro Credit Union. And then the bank says, hey, you better send me a certificate to make sure that, so that I know that you're Michael Kolakowski. So it's a little weird um, to think about it that way, but that's supposed to be, well, not supposed to be, is more secure, okay? And so those sorts of things are required for 
applications on base. They get picky about that. So that's two way SSL at a high level. Make sense? So yeah, you were asking about authentication. So that was one part of it. Um, the uh, two way SSL configuration for uh, Drop Wizard was stupidly easy. I simply put in the YAML file um, some parameters that basically said use HTTPS and use client authentication and enable uh, certificates, something like that. And then, oh, I should also add that, okay, that's only part of it. The other part is obviously I have to have a uh, key store, right? A Java key store. So use a key tool for that. Have you had to have experience with key tool or key stores? So all sorts of information on that and those get fun and confusing to play with. Anything else? So how do you, how do you get your tests are you doing on cloud infrastructure to how you're deploying your, your tests? Because I wonder how you handle the key certificate stuff in that environment. Okay. If you're spinning up, if you're spinning up servers at edge mm -hmm. tests, how are you configuring, or, or at a high level, how are you handling generating a certificate and actually passing those back? Okay. So. Remember I said I had um, futzed around with Oracle for like a year and a half and I was really glad to get away from it? Yeah, well, I lied. Uh, okay, so we've got the uh, key store sitting next to my Drop Wizard app on Ascento SVM, right? Okay. So it's sitting there running and just listening for requests, the, the Jetty server is. And that's got, I, I used key tool to generate a key store, generate the private key and all that other junk. And then we have an application that runs in web logic. So now I have to play with OSB and get OSB to play nice. So I put an associated key store in OSB and that requires hours upon hours of configuration because no one knows how to do anything in OSB and the docs are not a whole lot of fun to read. So you have to configure umpteen different things within OSB, place the key store in the right place, and then your application. So we have our application running as ears, and those, our application uh, reaches out to OSB via uh, proxy services, okay, and then um, those proxy services have a message routing path to a business service, and then the business service has the endpoint to that CentOS VM. And then you also have to put a security key provider within OSB, and then you have to set up the security realm within the WebLogic OSB domain console. It's like terribly confusing. And when I stood up and um, so I bet a lot of people here will appreciate this. Uh, when I stood up and gave a demo, I found a picture of one Dr. Burnham and I put him up there <laughs> because I had to explain why this was taking me so long, right? And I said, this is interesting because on every single test that I took in Dr. Burnham's class, and uh, for those of you that don't know, Dr. Burnham was a fairly notorious uh, information assurance professor who was at the Peter Kiewit Institute for many years, and he's since retired and moved to New Mexico. Every single test on his class, he had um, the same question. And that question, you're laughing because you know it. What are the two hardest problems about cryptography? So anyone besides Juan know the answer? Yeah, and implementation, key management and implementation. And so I remember thinking this is really stupid because it's on every test and I'm like, okay, what's the point of this? And now like 15 years later, I'm thinking how right he was, how applicable that was. It really is a pain in the butt. 
So if you want to play around with key stores, good luck. Um, but <laughs> maybe it builds strong bones. I don't know. So good question. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to mention one of my personal favorite Drop Wizard features, since I've been working with it, is uh, if you happen to be working on a Spring Boot app, you're probably familiar with Actuator, which gives you metrics on a per rest endpoint basis for access counts and last response time. Uh, if you just add Drop Wizard as a dependency in your POM file, Spring Boot will automatically pull in Drop Wizard's metrics and we'll start giving you running average, 99th, 95th percentile, standard deviation, and a whole bunch of extra metrics over time for all your rest endpoints, which is super helpful for production monitoring. And you don't have to use any other drop wizard features. It's just the metric stuff that automatically, uh, magically starts working. Nice. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I like the fact that it's pretty easy to stand stuff up and it comes bundled with a ton of stuff and mostly the things that they think are good. Where they're like, hey, Jersey, it's the best one. So is Jetty. So, so with your client side SSL certificates, mm -hmm. were you able to log the identity of the client key? Or was that just like a one-time thing? Or was Mm -hmm. You know that because his key gets used more than my key. Oh, okay. Lock the identity of the client key. I kind of got to think about that. I'm not sure. Yeah. No worries, that's fine. It's all good. No, I'm, I'm trying to think if we are... Yeah, I, I'd have to go look at the logs carefully. I mean, we... That wasn't ever a thought for us because we just have, you know, the key store that we generated with its private key and then the one that we have in WebLogic. Now, they have all sorts of keys, but I wanted to make sure I understood everything, so I blew them all away and just did, um, you know, generated my own from scratch. Because, so uh, a word to the wise, if you ever have to do anything with, um, key stores, I highly recommend starting completely from scratch because sometimes things will work and they'll seem like they're working, but you don't know. They're only working because of some other previous setup. And so then you go to deploy it elsewhere or test it elsewhere and, and things blow up nasty in your face. So that was one of my takeaways. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Did you look at any other products that do something similar? And if so, why did you pick this one? Uh, no, and because I was told to. <laughs> <laughs> so there were previous uh, Drop Wizard applications, because this wasn't the only external web service. However, Ours, I, I had the good fortune, as it were, ours was the first one to require all the fun things like the two-way SSL. That had never been done before. I mean, it's been done before. We'd never done it. <laughs> so it was, here's an existing thing that uh, other people have used. Unfortunately, it, it didn't seem like, um, you know, anyone really knew a whole lot about Drop Wizard. So our... Uh, code base uh, has been inherited from a previous government contractor. So we got a lot of stuff that people don't know about. So there was some knowledge, but you have other people in other teams, right? So you can only bother them so much, and it was, you go do this task and figure it out. So I did. I think, um, I don't know what other tools you could use. I, I think there's a, a Python package out there that does similar things and uh, maybe Spring Boot is one as well that you could use. Right oh. oh yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, you were going to talk about that on one of these OJUGs, right? So what's the Groovy support like for Wizard? I don't know. We're not using Groovy. No one wants to there because oh. Groovy encourages. Oh. 
one person wants to there <laughs> because it encourages sloppy programming, right? <laughs> All right, well, if that's uh, it for questions, like, oh, more, yay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't cost anything. Okay. Was there any drawbacks or annoyances with Drop Wizard? Like anything that just didn't work very well or problems? You know, not particularly. And that's, yeah, I can't really think of any. I, my annoyances were OSB. <laughs> Um, Are you in a service registry? So for all of your services that you're deploying, does it scale out and maybe you get 10 of them? Oh, like Drop Wizard? Yeah. No, I mean, we literally just, um, through the uh, jar, the YAML file out there on a VM, and then put a script in uh, init.d that said, go call it and run it as a service. So. Okay. The way we're doing it, yeah, that would not scale very well. Okay. But we have like four or five, so it's not a big deal, yeah. Yeah. right, for us. Not an issue. And if we think of, um, uh, what was that guy's name, uh, Baruch's talk, mm -hmm. right? Don't bother fixing that until the pain comes and, and you need to. So, yeah, issues with Drop Wizard, I, I guess I can't really think of any, and that's probably because they use things like Jetty and and guava and so forth. Um, you know, I had a couple annoyances with some of their documentation, but I think that just goes with about anything, right? We all know documentation can be a pain. And um, there were a few things that seemed to be missing for me, like reading about the configuration classes, but overall, even that's pretty good on their site. Is there another question back there? No? Okay, I feel like I'm ending like way early. I guess not. So, cool. I think then, um, thanks for letting me share Drop Wizard with you all. I, I hope that was somewhat informative. And I think now we do our IntelliJ raffle, right? Yep. Cool.